thank you, God, for the sacrifice that you made for us. Thank you that you have not only sent your son to be the lamb for us, but God, that you've called us to be lambs as well, that we would follow you, that we would hear your voice, that we would do the things that you've asked us to do. God, we thank you so much that you made a sacrifice for us out of love and that in that same love you call us to be your children. Thank you, Lord, for the honor that it is to be able to come before you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, real quick before Chris comes up, we have a couple of announcements we need to make. So as Leanne said, we are not doing a Good Friday service this year um, with Pastor Troy and Sarah being out of town. They won't be back until Saturday. And also with the current state of things, we would need to um, sanitize the whole church again in the week. And it's a lot to do. <laughs> so we unfortunately will not have a Good Friday service this year. Also, in previous years, we have had a pancake breakfast on Easter Sunday, and we are not doing that this year. Um, and like other years, we are also not having Sunday school next Sunday. So if you come early, you'll be hanging out with me while I get slides ready. <laughs> Otherwise, sleep in a little bit, enjoy a little time with your family in the morning, and we will see you at 1030 next week. But we are excited this morning to have Chris with us. Um, I had the privilege of reading through his notes while I was putting everything in, and it is going to be a wonderful service. So be prepared to be blessed. Thank you, Alyssa. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm not Pastor Troy. They're out having a good time, and you're stuck here with me So this, this morning. So... Um, one thing I, I was really amazed at, and this, is, this has got to be credit to the Holy Spirit, is Leanne, I didn't tell you what I was preaching on today. No, I didn't. But every worship song we sang this morning, she sang my sermon. So let's dismiss and go home. No, no, no. So today, of course, if you look on the calendars, it is Palm Sunday. And when Jesus comes triumphantly into Jerusalem riding on a donkey... Which, beginning, which begins the, the Holy Week leading up to his death and resurrection on the cross. But also around this time is another holiday, which is Passover. So today I was going to uh, preach from a Passover perspective about, about Jesus. Now, uh, also, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite times of year because, number one, the snow is melting it, it, it's getting to start to see green grass. The birds are back. You know, I have family back in Pennsylvania. And every time they, during this time, you know what they do for fun? They, they go up riding around and look for robins. And when they see the first robin, they call each other and say, hey, I saw a robin today. So that, that's what they, their idea for fun is during the, the spring. And I love spring. Everything's new. Um, and also during springtime, Usually they, they air one of my most favorite movies of all time, which is The Ten Commandments. And I always loved it as a kid watching it. And it was so long. I mean, it was like a four-hour movie. Some, some, sometimes they would have to break it up to two parts, you know. Uh, but love that movie. Now, of course, The Ten Commandments, you know, based on events of the Bible. And again, they use some artistic license in there. Um, but it, it, it's, it's great, and, it, and if it can lead you to, you know, looking, researching the Bible about that time. So, today, as we get started, we're going to talk about uh, the Passover and going back to a time in Egypt. Now, we all know the story. The uh, Israelites settled in Egypt, and they were there for a while this was a time of, of Joseph. Joseph's family um, brought him in. They were there for a while, and then the, the Pharaoh died, and a new Pharaoh came to power, not knowing who Joseph was, not knowing they can trust Israel. And over, over the uh, course of time, they begin to fear Israel. And finally, Moses was born. And Moses was going to be the one that God chose to lead his people out of Egypt, out of bondage. And so we all know the story that uh, Moses was out 
and he killed a, a, a fellow, um, he killed a, an Egyptian, and he fled. And he was uh, hiding out in the desert, the wilderness, for 40 years until one day he saw that burning bush and the voice of God came out of it and says, you know, Moses, you're going back to Egypt and you're going to lead my people out and bring them here. And, of course, you know, the struggle with Moses, uh, send somebody else and all that. Um, he uh, finally, you know the story, he, he finally went. And when he went back, now he was 80 years old. So he wasn't a spring chicken anymore. And so then began his time in Egypt and his fight with Pharaoh, which cultivated uh, and if you can put this slide up here on the plagues of Egypt, God had hardened Pharaoh's heart, so God said, "Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to I'm going to send you some um, uh, plagues on you." So of course, the first one was the water turned turn into blood, and so that was the when the every uh, drinking water from the Nile all turned to blood. Then after that became the, the plague of frogs. Frogs were everywhere. And after that, the gnats. Some of your, your translations may, may call it lice, but the gnats rose up. Then after that, the flies. Then there was a plague on uh, the livestock. Then the people were afflicted with boils. Finally, the hail the hail that would came down and turn to fire, which was a pretty cool look on the Ten Commandments. That was I like I like that one. Locusts, darkness for three days, then finally, then finally the one last plague that God was going to bring, that was going to totally uh, bring uh, Egypt, excuse me, to the point where they're going to let Israel go. And this was going to be the death of the firstborn. So this is where we're going to bring this up here. So if you have your Bible, you can turn it on, turn up the app to open the page. We're going to look at uh, passages in Exodus 11, just a little bit 11, um, parts of 12, not the whole thing, but just parts of 12, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So anyway, I didn't even tell you what my title of my sermon was. So my title of the sermon is The Lamb, The Blood, and the bones. So we're going to take a look at all three of those and how they fit in with the Passover as well as with, with the work that Jesus has done on the cross. So God's here speaking to Moses. This is in Exodus chapter 11, starting in verse number one. Now the Lord said, said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. See, up and before that time, you know, uh, Pharaoh tried to make bargains with Moses. Okay, I'll let you go here, but you must come back. And every time Pharaoh looked like he was going to say, okay, you can go, he'd always harden his heart, and he wouldn't let him go completely. But this time, this was going to be the, the plague that's going to drive the people of Israel out of Egypt completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight... I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites... Not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So this was going to be it. 
Moses finally came back to Egypt. He was going to go back and lead his people out of Egypt into a place where God had chosen them uh, to worship and on their way to the promised land. So this was what the Israelites were praying for. This is what they hoped for. And finally, it was about to come true. And they had one more plague to go through. Then as we jump to uh, Exodus, um, Exodus 12. So I'm going to just read some excerpts of this. So the first excerpt, excerpt is going to be uh, 1 through 14 of chapter 12. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is going to be your first month, the first month of your year. See, now they're going to be a free people. They're going to start their own nation, no longer under the bondage of slave and under control of Egypt. So they're going to be, you know, in their own. Tell the people, the whole community of Israel, that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount lamb of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose, okay, here's, here's what you've got to pay attention to. The animals you choose must be uh, a year old males without defect. So hold that for a while, with, without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Um, going on, uh, the Lord gives Moses instructions of, of how, how, what, to, what are they to do. Um, do not eat the meat raw, but roast it over fire. Um, uh, you are to eat it with your cloaks tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. And on that night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn uh, of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So the first thing I want you to you know, pay attention to is the lamb without defect. That, that's very important. Here's the second thing. This is the blood. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate this as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So the first thing first, again, have the lamb. They were going to slaughter it for their, their meal, their Passover meal. The lamb had to have no defects in it had to be perfect. Then they were to uh, take the blood, take a brush, and, and apply it to the door frames on their homes. And the blood's important. Because when the Lord sees that blood, he will pass over that home and not kill anyone in it. But if he didn't see that blood then they were open season to be struck down if they were the firstborn uh, in their family. So, then going down further in the passage, so Moses summoned all the people together and, and talked about it. It says, slaughter the Passover lamb and take a, a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood of the basin and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out uh, shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land and strikes down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. So we've got the lamb, uh, the lamb without defect, a perfect lamb, the blood, the blood for protection against the, the Lord striking down the firstborn. And then finally, throughout the passage here, we get to this one verse. Um, it says this. He talks about the, the Passover meal. The Passover meal, it must be eaten inside your house. 
take none of the meat outside of the house. Do not break any of the bones. So there's my, my sermon, the lamb, the blood, and the bones. Now we're going to put that together and show you how this points to, to Jesus Christ. So the lamb. So going back to the lamb, the lamb of Exodus 12, 5. Again, the animals you must choose must be a year old male without defect. You may take them from the sheep or goats. Uh, the, the lamb, again, must be without defect. This is what, when Jesus uh, was at the temple and he saw people, you know, selling sacrifices and animals for sacrifice in the, in the temple market, this is what got, got him upset because he knew that some of those sacrifices weren't acceptable to the Lord. You know, they weren't perfect. You know, the, the lamb had to be perfect. It was not something that you could uh, order from the website Wish and hope that it would come perfect. It had to be a perfect lamb. And why is that important? Because the lamb would then become a part of the sin offering later on when Israel settled into the promised land and the, 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 the lamb represented Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a man who struggled with sin, not struggled with, with temptation just like us, but yet there was no sin in him. Jesus was perfect. He was um, walking in, in the countryside, and John saw him, John the Baptist saw him and says, look, here comes Jesus. He says, look, he's the Lamb of God, he who takes away the sin of the world. And we sang about that today in worship, that Jesus Christ is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what makes Jesus unique and Christianity unique because every other, other person who is supposed to be a, a religious figurehead has sinned. They can't save you. They might have been nice people, but nice people, you know, can't save you. Jesus Christ was that perfect lamb, that perfect person that, that died in our place. So, again, First Peter tells us this, that, that the blood of, of Christ is a lamb without blemish or, or, uh, or defect. Because Jesus himself committed no sin and no deceit. And no deceit was in his mouth. But you know him as he appears in verse 1 John uh, 3, 5. But you know that he appears so that he may take away our sins. And in him, there was no sins. See, what, what's going on here simply is this. When the Israelites finally made it to the promised land, after wandering in the desert for 40 years, uh, they, uh, God instituted for the people of Israel to do a sin offering. And so this is found in uh, Hebrews 9 and 10. And I didn't mark this on the, the notes, but Hebrews 9 and 10 tells about this. In Hebrews 9, starting in verse 11, uh, again, so here's what, what they did. So every year, the priest would offer sin offerings for the people. And so they would do it year after year after year. And so this pointed now, back then, the lamb, the perfect without defect, pointed tor towards Christ. Let's take a look at this. So this, if you have your Bibles, this is Hebrews uh, 9, starting in verse number uh, 11. So when Christ came as high priest of good, of, of good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Ta tabernacle. That is not man-made. That is to say, not part of this, this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all, 
by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So again, the, the priests of, of Israel would do this on a yearly basis. It's sacrifice a lamb uh, for the sin offering. But once and for all, Jesus became that final lamb, the one that uh, was once and for all. So going on here, um, the blood of uh, goats and bulls and the ashes of, of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who has uh, through the eternal spirit offered him himself unblemished, unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, and those who are called may, may receive what he promised, an eternal inheritance, that he died as a ransom to set free from sins committed under the first covenant. So, basically, the, the, the sacrifices that the priests did back in Israel's time and, and day, they were good for one year, and people still sinned. And they got to do it all over again. But Jesus, the perfect lamb, became the ultimate sacrifice for us because he, know, he knew no sin. And because of that, it makes us right with God. Now, now we are able to come to God and, and know him and know his power. The second thing pointed out back in the text, back in Exodus, is the blood. And again, this is verses, uh, uh, chapter 12, verses 7 and 13. They are to take, to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So back in the Exodus, or excuse me, the, the, the time of Passover, the blood on the doorframe represented protection from the wrath of God. God's wrath was going to be poured out on the firstborn of the Egyptians, and not only the, the, the people, but the animals as well. But in order to make a distinction... God instructed the people of Israel to put that blood from the lamb. The blood came from the lamb on the doorframe. And when the death angel came by and uh, he, he saw that the, 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 the blood was applied, he passed over. And he moved on. And not a single person inside those homes were touched. The blood is important for us. Because without God, or Jesus Christ, shedding his blood, there is no way that we could be safe. By all means, when people don't have not accepted Christ, they're, they're like the Egyptians back then. They are subject to being, uh, you know, t taken care of, you know, by the death angel. Those who do not have Christ are... On, on, the, on a way to hell. But the blood protects us from that. The blood keeps us from that path. So, and even you know, the Lord said this in, in Isaiah, where he says this, Come now, let us settle this matter, the Lord says. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they shall are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. One of the things about sin is this, and the devil likes to play tricks with you and play with your mind and says that there are stuff that you have done a long time ago that you will never be forgiven for. But I'm going to tell you something, that there is nothing that you could have done that the Lord can provide cleansing for that sin as long as you confess it. Nothing. And even though the devil may whisper in your ear, are you sure? Are you sure you're saved? 
And you can say, without a doubt, I got the blood applied on me, and I am safe from you or, you know, or, or, and God's wrath. So the protection, again, brought out in Romans 5, chapter uh, 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So just as the wrath of God was being poured out on the Egyptians back in uh, the, during the Passover meal, we will be spared that wrath. Why? Because we got the blood of Jesus in us and applied to our hearts when we accepted him as our Savior and our Lord. Because that, that blood signified safety. Safety. And getting back to uh, the Hebrews passage, this is in, in uh, okay, here it is, in verse number 26. Then Christ would have to have suffered many times since the creation of the world, but now he appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once, and then after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So Jesus Christ took our sins on the cross. His blood was shed. He was the lamb. He was a lamb without defect, the lamb without sin. He was the only one that could take our sins. He shed his blood, the blood that was poured out on the door frame in Egypt, been applied to our hearts. And it took away our sin. And and getting back to this, now, again, back in the, um, the Old Testament days, when the Israelites, the, the priests, would sacrifice those lambs year after year, it tells us here in Hebrews chapter 10 um, that, um, and, and this is number four, because it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, therefore, Christ came into this world. So, the lamb that was sacrificed during the Passover, the lamb, the goats, the, the, the bulls that are sacrificed during the, the sin offering, they were required every year. But Jesus, from what his work on the cross, was the once and for all. For the sins you have committed, the sins that you may commit in the future, and all of us are human, so most likely you'll be committing sins. But the Lord has covered those sins. We ask for forgiveness because those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what does the blood do? The blood offers protection. It protects us from the upcoming wrath of God. That's not to say that as Christians we're going to face Difficulties that are not Christians, we're going to face persecution all the time. Because mainly godly people were, were martyred throughout in the biblical history and even today. You hear every day about a, a Christian pastor in some part of the world being killed or martyred. So it doesn't, I mean, we're, we're most likely going to be persecuted. But the, the blood protects us from the wrath of God. When we stand before him on, on judgment day, he will see, just like he saw the blood on the doorways in Egypt, the blood on your heart, he will say, come on in. You are safe. No harm will come to you. But those people that don't have the blood upon their heart, just like the blood was not on the doorways of the Egyptians, the, the Bible tells us, that not there was not one household that did not have someone who passed who died, and the weeping and wailing was like nothing ever heard or ever will be again. 
But there's a time of coming where people are going to weep and wail because they had an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior, but they said no. They, they, they rejected it. They did not go out there and put the blood on their door frames. And so the Hebrews tells us that, in fact, the law requires, again, that nearly everything to be cleansed with blood and nothing without the shedding of blood, there is no, no forgiveness. So Jesus paid for our sins. The blood of Jesus healed us, healed our relationship with God. Before, we were uh, estranged from God. But that blood provided by God's plan since the beginning of, the, of creation brought us peace now with God. Because if you'll notice this, back in uh, Exodus, when the, when the angel of death, the destroyer, came through, not even a dog barked in the, the, uh, the Hebrew houses. No commotion, no weeping, no wailing. There was peace. The peace in the midst of total destruction, of, of just terrible plague. And you know what? That's what, 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 being, what being with Christ is. You know, you may have turmoil out there, turmoil, you know, throughout life. But, but Christ gives you that peace that passes all understanding. And the world, you know, they can't figure that out. You know, your, your car may break down. Your roof may leak. Your basement might flood. You may, you know, get sick. But you have that peace because you're going to be with God. You're in God's hands. You're in God's protection. We are no longer condemned. The people in Egypt were condemned. The, the firstborn were condemned. The blood keeps us from that condemnation because now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's the work he has done on the cross in which we celebrate this, this, this holy week, cultivating in his death and his resurrection. And finally, the bones. Going back to Exodus, this is Exodus uh, uh, 12, verse 46. Again, um, God gives Moses instructions. Moses and passes it on to the people. The, the Passover meal must be eaten inside the house. Take none of it, none of the meat outside of the house. Do not break any of the bones. So that was a little, a little verse there. Don't break any of the bones. So what, now what does that mean? Well, as we now look in John chapter 19, this is the account of the gospel of John about the, of the death of Jesus. So this is uh, John 19, verses 28 through 37. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge to the, on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus, to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head, gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man, who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe these things happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and the other, scripture says, 
they will look on the one they have pierced. So don't break any of the bones was the commandment that the Lord gave to Moses, which he gave to people. Don't break any of the bones of the lamb for the Passover meal. Finally, on Jesus' death, his legs were not broken. And this was a fulfillment of a, of a psalm, Psalm 3420, where it says simply this, the Lord, he's talking about, he protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Now, now, why is this significant? Well, it's significant because, I mean, who in, in, their, in their wildest dreams could say that his bones will never be broken? You know, thousands of years before this event occurred, the bones were not broken in the lamb, the lamb that represented Jesus. And finally, when Jesus uh, appeared on earth, on his death, his bones were not broken. So crucifixion is a method of punishment uh, or capital punishment in which the victim is tied or nailed to a large wooden beam and left to hang perhaps for several days until eventual death from exhaustion and a, a, a fixation, asphyxiation. So the causes of death, some of the causes of death that could come from uh, uh, crucifixion are cardiac rupture, heart failure, hypervolemic shock, acidosis, asphyxia, arrhythmia, and pulmonary embolism. Death could result from a combination of those factors or from other causes, including sepsis, um, following infection due to the wounds caused by the nails or by the scourging that often preceded crucifixion, even dehydration or animal uh, predation. So animals could attack the bodies that they were left to the hang. Okay, now here's what, what the, the reason why they broke the, the legs of the people. During the course of crucifixion, on rare occasions, it is necessary to break the shin bones of the condemned person hanging on the cross in order to hasten his death. So that's why they did it, because I, I, I heard once where what they would do is to try to get some air from their lungs. They would kind of push up with their legs push up to get get some air. And when they broke their legs, they could no longer push up with their legs. So in order to breathe and continue living, it was necessary to push down with the feet on the wooden platform that was secured to the cross. By attempting to stand and relieve the pressure exerted on the lungs due to the outstretched arms uh, that were nailed to the upper cross member, the nail was driven through the flesh and bones of both feet that would cause the tissue to be torn and bleed profusely. The pain was that was necessary to complete the simple uh, I lost my mother note here. Did I drop this? Okay, so the the pro okay, thank you for the <laughs> process of breathing became continuing in self-torture, the condemned man will have to choose between intense pain of raising himself to breathe or dying from a lack of oxygen. So they would break the bones to, uh, to stop them from uh, you know, going up and down on the cross. But when they came to Jesus, they didn't have to do that to Jesus because he's already, already died. Fulfilling that scripture that not a bone would be broken. So the conclusion that I would like to say for you, you know, you today is this. If, if you know Jesus, and he's your savior, and you have his blood applied to your heart, that will offer you protection, that will offer you peace, that will offer you, you know, a way you know, to communicate with God. But those out there that don't, have uh, that blood applied to their heart because they never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now is the time to do that. Because just back in, during the, the Passover, when the, the Lord came and put his judgment, poured out his wrath on the people of Egypt when he did not see that blood, uh, the oldest uh, son of both uh, humans 
and of uh, animals, they, they, they died. But that blood on the, the Hebrew's door, the angel, uh, the angel of death passed over, passed over, and not one uh, hair on that person in the, those houses were harmed. We're coming to a time where, where one day we can be standing for, you know, in front of the, the Lord and being judged. But when God sees that blood that we accepted on our heart, we'll be passed over from eternal judgment. So his blood cleanses us from the sin, heals our relationship with God. His blood protects us from God's wrath, uh, just as it did back then. He protect us from his wrath right now. So everyone, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we're going to close now. Go ahead and stand. Close your eyes. I just want to say a prayer for you. And maybe you can... As, as Leanne softly plays, this is your opportunity to, uh, to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Lord, I ask that uh, you search the hearts of, of people out here, Lord, both in church, Lord, and those watching us online. Lord, if anyone has been sort of struggling with knowing when to, uh, to receive you or not, or perhaps they've been reminded of past sins. Maybe they're reminded that, hey, that there's stuff in their lives that they're not too proud of, they're ashamed of, Lord, and that you cannot forgive them. Lord, but Jesus Christ, who is our sacrifice, took care of that once and for all. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you put on someone's heart, Lord, to, to accept you now, Lord, to search their hearts and, and to look for that blood. Because... Nothing but the blood of Jesus can, can cleanse us to protect us and to make us whole once again. Lord, as we go our separate ways in the Lord, I ask that you give everyone protection, Lord, as they travel to home or wherever they're, they're going to go. And Lord, bring us back again next week as we celebrate your resurrection.